So we're now inside of my IntelliJ project for the monolithic implementation of the flight listing app or FLAP. And what I'm gonna do in tonight's session is I'm gonna walk through the overall architecture of FLAP, paying particular attention to the various means by which we leverage springs, annotations, and other forms of dependency injection to connect the components together. So we'll talk about what the components are, we'll talk about how they connect, we'll talk about the main entry points into a monolithic spring app. And then as we go further, perhaps in upcoming weeks, I'll look at more of the implementation details, looking at the method implementations, which show off a couple of cool things. And we'll also probably next week demonstrate some things that relate to using a, an Android client to actually access the capabilities that are provided by this server. Uh, there's other things that, we're, that are part of this that we're not gonna cover tonight. These have to do with some of the security related aspects and those will be covered in later weeks because that topic hasn't really been covered yet. But what we're gonna to cover tonight are basically the kinds of things that are in uh, week one of the videos that we have about dependency injection and uh, the frameworks, inversion of control, all that kind of good stuff. So if you open up the project, you'll see that there's a uh, you know, source main Java server folder. And in that folder, there's a bunch of subfolders or packages, and they are in no particular order, or maybe alphabetical order, account, airline, airport, common, exchange, flight, security, and then there's the flight application. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start by showing you the flight application. Now, as we'll also get further into this stuff, there's also a whole bunch of resources that are used to configure various characteristics or properties that the, the server uses, for example, um, it contains schemas and data for populating the various persistent databases, persistent stores. There's a file that keeps track of various properties, like what port number this server will listen on, and so on and so forth. And then, of course, we also have a bunch of tests, and these tests are primarily unit tests, I think maybe one or two integration tests, that exercise all the various features that are part of the, the various services and components and repositories and so on, and just are used to, to demonstrate how it works and make sure it's working properly. This, of course, is just you know, good old uh, test-driven development practices. And uh, you know, in a real system, of course, we would hook this up to a continuous integration, continuous deployment or delivery uh, infrastructure, and just keep testing it to make sure all the changes that we make don't break anything. But for now, it's good enough just to illustrate that everything's working as planned. So let's start by talking about flight application. And as you'll no doubt notice when you watch the other videos that cover how Spring is designed, kind of the main entry point into a, into a server, a monolithic app in this case, is some kind of application. And that's exactly what this is. This is an application, it's called flight application. It's a class and it's got a main method and that main method will turn around and run this class using Spring. So that's the Spring Boot framework using to drive everything. Now, this particular endpoint looks very mild and humble, but it's actually doing one heck of a lot of interesting things. And the interesting things that it's doing are not being specified imperatively. I'm not writing a lot of code. In fact, there's almost no code here. <laughs> you can see it's very sparse. Instead, what I'm doing is I'm annotating the code declaratively by using these annotations. And this is a form of something called aspect-oriented programming. And so we're describing through annotations declaratively certain properties we want this flight application to have. And the Spring framework then has a preprocessor, if you will, or a meta compiler or an annotation compiler that reads all these annotations and does the right things with them, involving generating code and finding dependencies and doing various configurations to set up security properties and policies properly and so on. In particular, this annotation here, Spring Boot application, enables the app, the flight application in this case, to use auto configuration, component scan, and also to define a bunch of extra configurations to the application class. So you need to use that annotation if you're trying to make a Spring application. 
You'll see later when we start talking about microservices that each microservice is actually a form of an application, but we'll get to that later. The enabled JPA repositories annotation tells the Spring Meta Annotation Compiler to use the Java Persistence API repository capabilities, and it will scan through the code that's part of this project in order to find where those annotations exist and then arrange to set up all the database plumbing needed to be able to create and store and access persistent data. This, this alone is probably worth the price of admission because otherwise you have to do this in a very tedious manual way and nobody wants to write code like that. And then the final piece of the puzzle here oh, is the uh, enable web security tag annotation. And that says, apply this class to the global web security. And we'll talk about security later. That's over here in the security package. We're not going to talk about that right now. Okay, so that's the entry point. Now, by itself, that's not very interesting. So let's start with the next interesting thing. So the next interesting thing is over here in the flight package. And if you go to flight, you'll see that there's two classes here. One is called flight controller and one is called flight service. This particular application, the, the most important thing here really is from a business logic point of view is the flight controller. There's only two controllers in this whole application. The other one's up here which is something called the account controller. We won't talk about that right now. That's, that's used for some of the security and authentication capabilities that we'll talk about later when we get to that part of the course. So this is, this is where some of the key magic happens. Now, if you think about what Spring is doing in this case, it's remember it's Spring Web MVC. And what this is doing is this is basically providing essentially an object-oriented facade or wrapper around the use of HTTP and JSON. So HTTP, of course, is a protocol that's also covered. I think it starts in the next week lectures. And that is a way of sending various kinds of commands back and forth between a client and a server or a sender and a receiver. And those commands are things that you're undoubtedly familiar with, like get, put, post, and delete. Those are the commands. That's the vocabulary of commands that you can have when you're developing a, uh, a RESTful server using HTTP. The problem is nobody on their right mind wants to write code at that level. It's very tedious and very error prone. So Spring has this concept of a controller. And this particular controller is going to be used as essentially the, the mediator API that is the single point that's exposed to clients. All the other things we're going to look at are not exposed directly to clients except the account controller, but ignore that for now. Uh, so the, the flight controller is really exposing a set of endpoints or routers, if you will, to clients. And the clients could just be a, you know, a web page. It could be an Android client. It could be an iOS client. It could be a JavaScript client. It doesn't really matter. Uh, it could be any kind of client that can send HTTP get and post request. So the particular set of services or capabilities offered by our flight controller will involve being able to synchronously find all available flights, find the best price for a given flight request. Like I want to fly from LA to New York, what's the best price? You can get a list of airports and you can also find departure dates for a given pair of airports. And some of these APIs, some of these endpoints are needed by the client to do things like populate the list of airports. If you ever use a booking app like Southwest or Expedia or whatnot, they have a list of airports you can fly to and from. And then there's also a list of departure dates. So this particular controller is mediating or giving access to those capabilities. The way you do this is you take the flight controller class, which is otherwise just a good old Java class, and you annotate it with the REST controller annotation. And that basically tells Spring and its aspect-oriented weaving tools that it needs to make this particular class be capable of taking HTTP requests that come to it and then being able to route them to the appropriate endpoints. And we'll see how that works in a second. Okay, you'll also soon learn about some other annotations like get mapping and post mapping, which we'll see in a minute. And 
no surprise, those correspond to uh, get requests and post requests and so on. So let's see how this is going to work. This is a very cool pattern that you see a lot. This is really the essence of dependency injection or part of the essence of dependency injection. And what we're going to do is we're going to define ourselves a field called flight service, which is a type flight service. And that is going to be where the business logic goes to implement all these various endpoints that we're defining here in this controller class. And you can see that we have another annotation here called auto-wired. And auto-wired is essentially a way of telling Spring's dependency injection engine, this is the field that I need, but I'm going to leave it up to you to find me the right implementation for this field. And it's going to do that connection. It's going to connect those things together automatically. So you do not have to, if you choose not to, you don't have to write constructors. You don't have to initialize anything. You just write your fields, tell Spring you want them auto-wired, and then it will go ahead and auto-wire them using some implicit magic that it has under the hood. And we'll see how that magic works shortly. So flight service is also a class. This is this is whoops, this is flight service. And we'll come and talk about flight service here in just a second. So the, the easiest way to think about this is the flight controller is the part that handles the mediation between the world of HTTP and JSON into Java. And then the service is what actually does the business logic. So if you take a look here, are some of the interesting methods that are defined here. There's one called find flights. And you can see flying, find flights takes in the departure airport, the departure date, the arrival airport, and the currency that you want the to make the the flight to be priced in, you know, US dollars or British pounds or euro or yen or whatever. Uh, and what this does, find flights will take these parameters, which of course are coming as part of an HTTP get request. So that's why we use the get mapping annotation. And it's going to go ahead and take these parameters, which are passed in as strings, and then forward them to the appropriate implementer method in the flight service. So that's where the business logic actually gets done. And of course, what that's going to do is it's going to return a list of flights, and the flights will then contain information that we need to understand about you know, the cost and, and other properties that might be of interest to the, to the client to display that in a GUI. And you'll see all the methods here follow the same pattern. We have find best price, which will go and find a list of the best prices for a given flight. You might want to have like, you know, discounts or something. So you want to find the best prices. Once again, same basic idea. This is an endpoint that comes from a get request that gets turned into a method call by, by spraying using the magic of Java reflection and so on. And then we simply forward it off to the find best price method in our corresponding service. Similar kind of idea here. There's, there's a method that says, hey, give me the list of airports. And it'll give back a list of airports. So the airport would be like the airport code, like YYZ for Toronto or JFK or ORD for Chicago O'Hare or whatever. Same as before, this, this doesn't take any parameters, but it just goes ahead and says, get the airports from our service, returns a list of airports. And then the final method that's part of this kind of mediator portion is the find departure dates method, which takes the departure airport and the arrival airport, and it'll go look up in a database, as we'll see in a minute, and get back the list of dates when flights go from that particular airport. Okay, so just the basic starting point, this class is really kind of a, like I said, it's kind of a mediator, it's kind of a it's kind of a proxy, if you will. It's like, or an adapter, maybe adapter is a better word. It's taking, under the hood, it's taking in requests in HTTP format and then converting them into Java calls and then forwarding them to the flight service. So if we go look at flight service, this is where we actually see business logic. My purpose at this point is not to go into detail in the business logic. We'll, we'll cover that later. I just want to show you how the annotations work. So we mark flight service as a service. And for this particular example, services can be thought of as just objects in, in a good old object-oriented way. The, the main thing that you can do that is above and beyond what you get just by having an object is you can do this dependency injection auto-wiring stuff. You can think of a service as essentially a component that is going to be used 
to connect a controller to business logic. And the service annotation enables the auto detection and wiring of dependent implementation classes via something called class path scanning. And that just says it goes ahead and searches the class path to find the implementations of the service services in a particular order. So this particular service itself depends on a couple of other services. Now you can start seeing why they talk about things like spraying as being dependency injection, because we aren't actually providing the implementations of these services directly. We're letting them be auto-wired together by the spring framework. And the two services that we need, actually, I think we have three services here that we need. The flight service needs an airport service, which is going to give back the list of airports. It's going to have the airline service, which is going to provide information about airlines, like Southwest Airline or American Airlines or whatnot. And it also has another auto-wired field called exchange service. And that's used to do currency conversion between dollars to pounds or euros to yen or American dollars to Canadian dollars, whatever, whatever your currency of conversion of choice is. Because different airlines, if you're booking with Lufthansa, perhaps they're going to do their booking in euros or you're booking with um, Nippon Airlines. They do their bookings with yen or something like that or, or uh, you know, whatever the the Japanese equivalent of a monetary unit would be. Uh, I guess a Chinese airline would have yen. Um, but in any case, the, the point is that this is an, another service that does those conversions. If you take a look here, again, I'm not going to talk about the details of the implementation, but this is basically now, we are in the world of Java at this point. With the flight controller, we were in the sort of this shadow world, like Lord of the Rings, between the world of HTTP and JSON on the one hand and the world of Java. But the flight service, now we are in the world of Java. And so everything you're going to see here is Java. So we'll look at the implementation code later. You can see this uses Java sequential streams to do the processing. And there's methods here like find flights, and that uses a private method called try to convert concurrency, which does some cool things. We won't talk about that right now. Here's find best price. Find best price uses the airline service to go out and query all the airlines that our flight listing app knows about. And it gets all the different prices for this particular flight leg. And then it picks the best one. And our best ones, because there could be multiple ones that have the same low price. Find departure dates. This basically goes and does a database query to find when the dates for departure are. There's get airports, which goes and also does a database query on the airport service. And then there's a get rate method that goes and does a database query on the exchange service. So once again, you can see some really nice separation of concerns here. Notice how the code here, some of the methods only serve to forward to something else. And the reason for doing that is that allows our flight controller and flight service to provide the one-stop shopping for access of clients to business logic supported by this particular monolithic app. And, and that's important because it makes the security policies easier to enforce because we just have a single central entry point where everything flows through and we can do all kinds of authentication checking and security policy checking at that point. It's kind of like uh, you know when you walk into a building that has badge control, there's a single entry point perhaps where you have to get your badge checked or something. Some of the code here actually does you know, some business logic, but most of it's just kind of forwarding on to other services that do the work. Now, one of the things to note here is because this is a monolithic app, the actual connections between the flight service and the airport service, the airline service, and the exchange service are all done through services. And because of that, all of these components run in the same address space. If we wanted to, to make a microservice-based approach, then what we would have here would not be services. Instead, they would be proxies that themselves would talk to other microservices that themselves would be implemented by other controllers. And without spoiling too much of the surprise of what's coming later, when we start talking about the microservices versions of FLAP, or the flight listing app later, you'll see that all we're going to do is we're going to take the exchange and airport an airline services and wrap a controller around them so they can now run elsewhere. And this is a super cool pattern because it allows us to be able to get a fair degree of location independence. 
and a fair degree of location transparency without having to write a lot of that glue code ourselves. There is a little glue code you have to write in order to write the proxies, but it's very stylized and there's a lot of support in the form of things like REST templates and web clients that are provided by Project Reactor and Webflux and so on. And we'll talk more about that much later in the course. So what I'd like to do at this point is just quickly talk about some of the other services. So let's go talk about, for example, the airport service. So the airport service basically has two pieces. Let's talk about the airport service first. The airport service, which is how we go about finding information about airports. Um, and what this is going to do is it's going to have a method called get airports. And that's what was called by the flight service. And it's going to say, hey, repository, we'll talk about the repositories in a second. Please find all the airports that you know about. Well, what's the repository? The repository is a field that's auto-wired to something called an airport repository. And here is the airport repository. And the airport repository is super duper simple. It's simply an interface that extends the JPA repository class using airport and string as the parameters to parameterize this particular instance of JPA repository. And if you were to poke around in the JPA repository class interface, you'd see that there's a method called find all. And that goes ahead and returns everything that that particular repository instance knows about its contents. And this particular, the contents for this particular thing are stored over here in resources. And you can see in resources, there's a schema that says that the database will be going to contain airport code and airport name. So you could have, you know, JFK be John F. Kennedy Airport, or you could have YYZ be Toronto Airport or whatever. And it also says that airport code is the primary key. So this is essentially some SQL that is uh, just defining the table. And then over here, you can see the actual data that we're using to populate that table. So we're going to insert into our airport table the airport code and the airport name. And then you can see these various airport codes and the corresponding names that go along with them. So the cool part about this is we can get persistent storage pretty much trivially for free by knowing how to write declarative logic that's shown here with these schema definitions. Here's the way we connect it into something called an airport repository. And then we can have our airport service simply have a way to return a list of airport objects by doing an implicit query into the, the database that we set up using the JPA repository. So very simple, very convenient. Um, and for our initial purposes, very cool. You'll see later when we start talking about reactive programming that we're going to need more powerful asynchronous databases and we'll provide those at the right time. But this is good enough for starters. Something else that's worth talking about here are the common portions, things that are shared between the various packages. And these are essentially the, the plain old Java objects, the POJOs, that are the data structures that we use for things like describing the format of a database object, being able to translate between a table view and an object view or object instance, uh, and so on and so forth. So here, for example, is the airport class. We've seen examples of that. That's what gets returned from our uh, our airport service that we just looked at. If you look at airport service, you can see that the get airports method returns a list of airport objects. And here's what an airport object is. And this is yet another good example of the use of annotations that we get from Spring and other associated tools like Lombok. So for example, you can see here that uh, here's the airport class, which is just a plain old Java object. It's got an airport code field that's a string. It's got an airport name field that's a string. And then it has a little bit of annotations saying this airport code is the, the primary key, and it's got a length of three elements. And then there's also some other things we put here to annotate this airport POJO. Like we say that we want it, the tool, the aspect weaver, to automatically generate a uh, 
constructor with all the arguments needed, a no args constructor, a builder, which is a way of being able to assign things a piece at a time. And we're also going to treat this thing as an entity. And when you annotate something as being an entity, it means it can be stored in the, uh, the JPA in a database. So you, you can map, it can automatically be mapped and stored and retrieved and otherwise mo modified and so on in a JPA repository. So we have an airport uh, data structure, airport POJO. We have an exchange rate POJO, which basically has an ID, a from currency, a to currency, and an exchange rate. And we have a flight POJO, and that has an ID. And then it's got departure airport, departure date, arrival airport, arrival date, arrival time, how far the flights are, what the cost is in some particular currency like US dollars or Canadian dollars. We have the airline code for this particular flight, and then a bunch of other fields and methods that we add just to help with testing and unit testing and generating um, example data and so on. And then the final part of our data model is the flight request, which keeps track of the departure airport, where you're leaving from, the arrival airport, where you're going to, when you would like to leave, what, what date and time, how many passengers you'd like to book, and again, the currency that you're, you'd like the, the price to be given back in. So those are basically the, the data model portions of our application. And you can see that we're just defining plain old Java objects. There's, there's no setter getter methods, there's no constructors, there's no specific definitions of things like keys. All of that stuff is being handled through the annotation mechanisms that are built into uh, Spring and Lombok and so on. And then we also have a little helpful help work class called constants, which we use to be able to have nice symbolic names for things like the airport service or the exchange service or the American Airlines um, flight service and so on and so forth. So these are just things to make the code less brittle so you don't have to repeat yourself and run afoul when you change names or misspell something or something like that. Makes, makes your code more type safe. Let me talk very briefly about the airline service. So the airline service is going to basically be used to describe a particular airline, like American Airlines or Southwest Airlines. And the actual information about airlines is stored down here. There's a schema for this which keeps track of information about a flight. And then we have a little database for the different airlines. So there's a database for American Airlines. There's a database for Southwest Airlines. And these are all the flights that we have that could be used by clients to book. So this keeps track of all that information. Now, obviously, in a, in a real production system, this would be a lot more dynamic, but we just wanted to set something up to make it easy to understand. So you can see here we have, you know, arrival and departure dates, cost, the denomination, which airline it is, and so on and so forth. So if you go back over here, you can see that airline service uses an airline repository. That's what stores that information. And it's just got a couple of methods. There's a way of finding all the flights on that from that airline from a certain airport on a certain date to another airport. And that just works by using the JPA repository, which we'll look at in a second, to do a query to find that information. And then there's also one you can use to find the best price. Um, I'll come back later and, and talk about the algorithm for finding the best price. It, it turns out to be really cool. Um, uh, there's a lot of different ways to do it, but this is a simple way to do it. You can also find, look up things by departure dates. You can say the departure air, you can say, I want to go from this airport to that airport. Give me back all the dates when I can do that. And all of these calls just turn into queries on the airline repository, which again is a JPA repository that works on flight objects. We just talked about flight objects over here when we talked about the data model. And so you can see here that we have find by departure airport and departure date and arrival airport. And this basically uh, is just a, a mapping that's done that goes and looks up by those that information. And then here is a more interesting mapping a method called find departure dates where we actually give the query that we want run against the database. So it's going to go ahead and, and do a SQL query using the query annotation and we'll then be able to get back the list of departure dates. 
So once again, notice how much of the code we're writing that's declarative, very little imperative code. Most of this stuff is being done with uh, convention over configuration. We're annotating stuff. We're declaratively specifying things. And lots and lots and lots of code is being generated under the hood to make this all work. The final piece of the puzzle here is the exchange rate service. So the exchange rate service is going to connect to the exchange repository, of course, which is another database using JPA. And what it does is it takes the currency we're converting from, like dollars, the currency we're converting to, like yen or pounds, and it goes and looks up in the database and says, find me the conversion. What's the exchange rate for that? And the exchange repository is a JPA repository, as always, and it simply has this find by from currency and to currency, and it goes ahead and looks up in the database and does that. And if you take a look down here, here's the schema for all this, and here's the data that we use to provide the exchange rate, the, the somewhat fabricated exchange rate uh, for these different currencies. Now, of course, in in the real world, this would be connected to yet another microservice running elsewhere that would be giving you up-to-date currency conversions. Uh, for our particular example, we're making it simple, so we're just going to kind of hard code them. But you can imagine uh, an extension for the interested uh, reader or writer to, to take this and write your own microservice that would actually go periodically and query an actual currency exchange service. And there are a bunch of them out there that work with web-based data and then update and populate a database. So you could, you could do this in a way that would be um, very efficient, but relatively up-to-date. So that's basically the overall layout of this application. A couple things to note, again, um, it's really pretty much like writing object-oriented programs for the most part, in the sense that we've got these services that are like objects. Services depend on other services, and those services are connected together by dependency injection using auto-wired annotations. There's a thing called a controller that's kind of the front end that clients can make requests to, and then that controller takes the request, turns them from HTTP requests, get requests, post requests, or whatever, and then turns them into calls on Java methods that are disseminated throughout the dependency injected and auto-wired implementation of this monolithic uh, flight listing app. And we're using declarative mechanisms for being able to get access to, to persistence as well. And you'll learn more about those mechanisms a little bit later in the course. One other thing I wanted to talk about real quick here is the properties file. This is what you can use to set certain characteristics of the overall application in one location. So you can set the port where you want the monolithic server to listen for connections, which in this case is port 8081. You could choose whatever you want as long as it's something that's not in use. We have a name for our application, which is pretty boring. We set the time zone and then a bunch of other things to configure various properties that can be tweaked and tuned in various ways. You can explain where you want the database to reside. Do you want it to be in memory? Do you want to be on disk? You can set default usernames and passwords. I wouldn't do this in production system, but just for testing purposes. Um, and then you can also say you know, where you want to create and load all the tables with their initial data. And then here's some of the, here's some of the password related stuff. Again, you know, you need to be careful with this, not give it out to the world, but this is just a simple application. We'll talk about security related issues later. So this is just kind of a warm up. And then the final piece of the puzzle here that I'm going to talk about right now is what's in the tests folder. And as you can see here, if you go ahead and instantiate and run the tests, there's a whole battery of unit tests and integration tests that go off and basically uh, mock a client. It's not really talking across a network, but it mocks up things to look like a client. And it talks to the implementation through that flight application that we were looking at. And it goes ahead basically and tests all the various different services. So we test the exchange service. We uh, test the airline and airport service. We test the flight service and so on and so forth. And lo and behold, because we tested this stuff very carefully recently, all the tests pass. And if you want to, to amuse yourself, you can go and take a look at the tests. I won't, I won't walk through them right now, but they're, they're pretty extensive, and they give you a good feel for how you write tests that test these kinds of spring-based monolithic applications. When we're going to cover 
microservices later, you'll see that there's more types of ways to do testing. And we when we cover reactive microservices, uh, it's going to be even more interesting because a lot of the, com the computation and communication there takes place asynchronously. So there's some more sophisticated techniques you need to do for debugging. But anyway, rate, that's kind of an overview of the structure of the application relating back to a lot of the concepts that are covered in this week's video on the introduction to spraying and dependency injection and an inversion of control and so on. I should point out, I think this is hopefully pretty obvious, but this whole application is driven by inversion of control. So this is the main program. When this main program is launched, it runs the spring application, which goes ahead and sets up all the dependencies and connects everything together and auto wires it. And then it basically sits there in some kind of event loop, waiting for connections to show up from clients. And as connections show up, then callbacks take place up through the different objects and components and services and so on. And the conversions are made between HTTP to Java code and vice versa on the reverse path, the result path, the two-way calls. And all that stuff takes place with inversion of control. You as the application developer do not own the event loop. The event loop is run deep in the bowels of the Spring framework. And so you don't have to know or care what's happening under the hood until, of course, a bug occurs or something crashes, and then you have this giant stack trace to try to filter through. But anyway, that's kind of a tour through the overall architecture of this app. We will come back later and look at some of the business logic that we skipped tonight. But uh, this gives you a good essence, I think, of how everything works at this point.